Welcome to the Afro Anime Initiative. We discuss everything in Afro Future Anime to something that begins the letter Z. I'm your host, Darren Bradley, along with Paulina Guerriere. Hi, guys. And today we're going to be covering Marvel Rising Initiative, Disenchantment, and Voltron Season 7. Hey, but first, tell the people where they can find us. Okay, so you guys can find us almost everywhere here on YouTube, Afro Anime Initiative or Afro underscore AI or in this case, Afro AI, on Twitter, Afro underscore AI, excuse me, on Facebook, Afro Anime Initiative, or Afro AI again, and Instagram, Afro Anime Initiative, just one long word. And so far, yeah. Awesome. So a little, little energy today been a long week but it's a long week of really cool stuff to talk about so let's just jump right into it let's kick off with marvel rising initiative um and if i may start i have to say that watching this the first episode of this show marvel may have just saved the animation department because honestly the animation department since disney brought them has kind of sucked but this show was actually kind of cool it, it it's a mixture of a lot of new stuff um, a hint at some old stuff, and it's a all, I don't want to say all female cats, there's of course some male characters in the show, but it's one of those things where it's like, I can sit my godchildren down, they're all like seven years old, and they can watch that, and, they'll, and I think this show will be like, okay, I want to read comic books, and that's, I think a, a show like this, that's what it's, it's there for, to be like, hey, we're gonna introduce you this really cool stuff, and you may not know anything about it, but it's cool. So go buy all this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and after watching this episode, I'm like, you know what? This is something I think that will help get them introduced to comic books. Um, real quick recap: it's the story of Spider Gwen, but now they're calling her the Ghost Spider. And if you know anything from the comic books, it's you know Gwen Stacy, a uh, very old Spider Man character, but she's Spider Woman this, in this iteration. And it's her interacting with a lot of new Marvel characters that I've gained promises in the last couple of years, such as Squirrel Girl and Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan. Also mixed in with a little bit more, not newer, but they're definitely new compared to Marvel characters, Quake and Patriot. I almost called him Young Captain America, but Patriot. <laughs> uh, I, called, I would call him Young Falcon, though. Yeah, um, reminds so, me of Falcon. So, so. <laughs> right, and it's and those are like a lot of the newer characters in the Marvel lexicon of characters. And if you read the comic book, some of them have, like I said, longer. But in this show, they mix them all together along with some recent events from the comic books, and they work out fine. And it's just really good storytelling, and the characters are fantastically translated from the page to the animation screen. That's nice. That's really cool. Um, you know, it's uh, you have you also have like uh, the voice actors if if you recognize some of them. I know if any of you watch the Disney Channel would recognize Doe Cameron. She plays Gwen Stacy, um, Chloe Bennett as Daisy Johnson from Shield. Yes. So that's a really interesting crossover that they have, even though it's like this. Um, it's like a kind of a back and forth kind of thing. Like with one, you understand it's like one whole universe on another show. It's not. So I found it really interesting that they decided to bring shield into this. So that's a really fun thing to learn. Mm. Um, who else? We have Tyler Posey, who was in teen wolf. Interestingly enough, um, you have Catherine Kavari. If I'm pronouncing it correctly, she's uh, Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan. Uh, Miliana Vandro, again, forgive me, as Doreen Green, as Squirrel Girl. For all of you hardcore Marvel fans, for anybody else who doesn't know, who's, who's Squirrel Girl, Darren? Squirrel Girl is one of the most powerful mutants in the Marvel um, universe. And if you don't know what a mutant is, she's like an X-Men. Um... <laughs> But she is like just this 
really fun, adorable, optimistic um, woman, young woman and they, in her comic books. They try, she's a freshman in college, I believe, right now. Mm-hmm. Like, so they show her as a young woman, but she's one of the most powerful. And she breaks a lot of the old stereotypical body images of characters, too. Like, she's a nice, like, for lack of um, a better word, and there probably is a better word, but she's like a chubby little squirrel. She is. And uh, fucking adorable. And mm-hmm. she's also, like I said, one of the strongest heroes in the Marvel Universe. Like, she is... Um, her um the title of her comic books um is unbeatable squirrel girl that's how powerful she is yep and her powers are she has the strength of squirrels the ability to crawl up things like squirrels and communication with the squirrels and when you realize how many squirrels exist in the world that's a power (laughs) that's a lot of power and that's not include that's not including um those gigantic squirrels too that you see halfway in like those jungle areas of the world yes if you think about it yeah, so squirrel and and her translation from the the comic book page to the show is really on point. Like I said, she's just a very optimistic person. She wants to be a hero. Yep, like she, she has all does. this great power. And she wants to use it for good. Hmm. So that's. I mean, I think this would be for another episode, but it's it's like it's an anomaly, basically. Like you have all these powerful characters. And you don't really think about it until you take the time to really like sit down and analyze each character's attributes to the Marvel Universe, like how powerful they actually are. We're not including the Avengers. No, we're actually talking about actual mutants and inhumans, quote unquote. So, yeah, it's just it's just really, really, really interesting to see these characters come to life in another show for a whole new generation of Marvel fans, really. And like it was mentioned earlier it's a kids show and like you can you can definitely tell it's definitely a show for kids to you know something to sit down with your niece or nephew or your own kids or kids you babysit whatever and you you would i don't know if the kids would definitely enjoy it i don't know about y'all as adults i kind of did i'll be honest kind of right i think as adults they will because like I said, I'm a huge comic book fan, mm-hmm. and I just love the little things they threw in. And be like, yo, we read comic books. Guess what? You'll understand this. And if you don't read comic books, you'll enjoy it. So maybe get somebody else to read them too. Like, there's some stuff in there that was really enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Like, um, Patriot, for one, like I said, he is um, he is the grandson of the actual original Captain America, who is black, by the way. So I don't have this argument. It's in oh, continuity. Or yeah, con- yeah, continuity. Right. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're right. Um, and in this, he um has a shield, but his shield is also a glider. And anybody that read comics is like, oh, that's Green Goblin's glider, but it works. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. Why wouldn't he have a giant shield that can transform into a glider? Oh, and if you're too. a comic book fan, especially since the first person you see him fight is Spider Gwen or Ghost Spider, it makes sense for somebody with a glider. To be fighting a spider, because that's just comic book stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it just I mean, goes, it harps back to the classic Spider Man versus Green Goblin battles. So those little things that are thrown in there will make, you know, more um, adult and be like, okay, this is some, this is pretty cool. And it's just something I know I could share. And then I could, like, again, make those connections and translate them to a younger audience and buy them some books. Like, oh, you like that part where. Um, the Patriot is fighting the ghost spider where he's fighting with a glider. Well, here's Spider-Man doing this a hundred times against Green Goblin. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's just a really cool, like I said, it's just a really cool introduction to the Marvel verse. It, because it, it reminds me actually of the days I used to watch Spider-Man as a kid. Um, I forgot what days, but whenever <laughs> it came on, either I, I think it was Saturday morning, part of my Saturday morning cartoon lineup mm-hmm. i don't even remember it was so long ago but yeah way back way back when when i was a wheelo one yeah it definitely reminded me of that the humor kind of the animation the mm-hmm. just pretty much the interaction between the characters how you know everyone's like spider-man or spider gwen is the, the bad one it's like no no y'all got it wrong actually so it's fun to follow i i enjoy mm-hmm. it so yeah and like I said, I think this is something that could actually boost up Marvel's animation studio because since Disney got them, it hasn't—it just hasn't been that good, <laughs> you know. Just it just the quality has gone down. But this is like I said, good writing, mm-hmm. good animation, and it's building up on a lot of newer stories, so it can 
feed in for a new audience and hopefully expand some stuff. Maybe they'll even do like the old Saturday morning cartoons because people forget, like for us, X-Men animated series, Spider-Man animated series, the Fantastic, all of those shows crossed over. Mm-hmm. Like they were technically the first Marvel Cinematic Universe. But they were all in cartoon form. Yep. <laughs> like, so all, hopefully this would be a new expansion where they can add in some other shows and, you know, keep the momentum going. Like I said, I think it's just... So from that on to a show that is definitely not for kids. We both started watching Netflix's Disenchantment and... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, ba- it's basically... It's the same creators of... of, of sorry. Futurama and The Simpsons. So already off the bat, y'all know what kind of humor it has, what kind of animation it is. That it's not necessarily for kids, but you know, kids it will probably is. watch it anyways. They'll watch it anyways. I know. I, found, <laughs> I know. I'll find. I found a way to watch The Simpsons. Um, do you do you do you, do you want to say something about it, or do you want me to go on and? Uh, I'm, I mean, okay. <laughs> First off, the writing is incredible. That's the first thing. The writing is incredible. Layered characters. Well, some of them are. Um, layered characters. Good just inside jokes and quips. And how they've turned the fantasy drama or genre. Okay. The fantasy genre on its head is like, oh, I like this. But it's it's kind of dark. Like, the first episode, of course, we're dealing with forced marriages. Like, all right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, you know, talking about how she needs to, you know, control her destiny, but mm-hmm. her efforts have been thwarted every which way. Although, towards the end of it, spoiler alert, her husband-to-be, well, her two husbands-to-be, to be exact, because I think they were mm-hmm. brothers, right? Yeah. Yes. One of them accidentally stabs himself on what is it a sword sword cheer like game of thrones yeah (laughs) but still manages to survive throughout the whole episode he's look because he's an inbred idiot which they make sure to point out several (laughs) times like yeah (laughs) keep reminding people of that yeah that's beautiful animated show (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah no but no because it was a total thing in the middle east medieval mm-hmm. times anyway so of course um and then his brother it was just a self-centered prince like mm-hmm. any other prince <laughs> gets turned into a pig or switch switches bodies i don't know either way oh no it's transmogrification yeah 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 oh yeah yeah because oh the, no he gets turned <laughs> yeah he does he does but because then the pig Becomes a human. He, he, him, and it's like, okay. <laughs> so you have that in the first episode. <laughs> you have a tiny little demon following um, Princess Bean. Oh, she's called Bean. She has a horribly long name. I'm horribly not, long name. No, I'm not going to pronounce. Not even trying. No. Mm-mm. Nope. And it, it, like you said, it's basically <laughs> the story of this young woman coming into her own in the most vile <laughs> disturbing ways you could imagine <laughs> i mean just like any other teenager rebelling against their overbearing like any dad other teenage girl exactly <laughs> <laughs> like you have but, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. um crap i there's a there's a show okay so abby jacobson is the voice actress for bean and she was she was on a she was on a show on comedy central and it's like right at the tip of my tongue and I'm just like so mad. Broad City. There we go. She was in Broad City. If any of you mm-hmm. know of that show, it's actually pretty fun to watch. So she was on that. Um, you have Eric Andre as Lucy, the that little demon that everybody demon. thought. Yeah, that everybody thought was a cat. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, I guess the idiocy mm-hmm. is fitting. And it's so funny because they have cats in this universe. He uh-huh. looks nothing like any of them, and no, no one points it out. Like, okay, no, I mean, nobody, gonna, nobody knows better. No, it's not even that. I think that they're saying we're going to take this information because we don't want to know what you actually are and just pretend you're a cat and the entire kingdom. Yep, it's cat. Yeah, it just goes with it. Oh, yep. Might as well. Um, so John DiMaggio, of course, our beloved voice actor. You just know his voice anywhere as King Zog, Bean's mm. overbearing dad. Yes. Who's 
so self-centered and it's just hilarious. <laughs> angry dad syndrome. Ang- very angry dad syndrome. It just, I don't know what to make of him, but I laugh at him anyway. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm farther along in the show than Paulina is. Yeah. And there's some stuff there about him, but his, basically, for the first half of the show, and maybe a little bit more, just angry dad. Mm-hmm. That's, he's just, just a mad dad. Like, what the hell? Like, why is this happening? Why is my daughter such a loser? <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. It's like, oh, well, it's kinda, you know, it kind of reminds me has- of my dad. Great. He's not oh. as overbearing. <laughs> no, it does. Like, he's not as overbearing, but it's like, no, there's there's some similarities there. And, of course... You know, like father, like daughter. Apple does not fall too far from the tree. Indeed. She's very, very much like her dad, too. So. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so there's that. You know, if you want to see family dynamics, there's your story right there. Then you have, what's the other side? She has, Bean has two side cases. She has a demon oh. that she was given on her wedding day. That's and, a, and a little and elf. Then, and a little elf named Elfo. Yes. And I love the, 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 Structure of the elves in this in this world because mm-hmm. they're they're basically Santa Claus elves. Except these elves, all they do is make um, candy, candy mm-hmm. but they're, they're always cheerful. With, yeah, but they're also cross with the Smurfs, mm-hmm. and they again, this show is not for kids. They literally make this joke with the the fact, like remember in the Smurfs, if you're old enough to remember, there's only one girl. Oh, Smurf! And everybody's like, that doesn't make sense. So in this, they do it make it sense. And this girl sleeps with all the other elves. Yeah, she pretty much, except her own dad, obviously. But yeah, and her <laughs> name is Kissy. That's her. She's Kissy Elf. <laughs> and she does she way more for. than kissing. Yeah. Yeah. That's I've I've always I just always found that hilarious. Oh, yeah. and my favorite thing, my favorite thing are the little the little fairies, the little pixies, prostitutes. Good yeah. lord! Oh my god. It was so and clever, thing, and I just, I, I love them. <laughs> and it's not far from the tales we have. To get something from the fair, you got to pay a price. Yeah. Their price is just sex. Yep. It's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and the thing <laughs> is, and, and the thing is, they're, they're literally, they're like the old retired prostitutes or the ones who've been in the street for too long. Not the young too ones. Too long. Yeah, exactly. that's those are the old ones. I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, so yeah, disenchantment, a story of a fairy tale kingdom, and basically a the uh uh a growing growing up of the growing pains tell of this young princess. Mm-hmm. But it it has so many elements and like I said, some of them are dark, but it's like this is shit that people have to deal with and go through and it's a, surrounded by the real world. They just decide to put, you know, trolls and gnomes and giants and stuff in it. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. That's oh. another thing. The f- also in the first episode again, mm-hmm. they have a beautiful commentary about war. Elfo walks into a war between the giants and the gnomes, and he's like, "What are y'all fighting for? We fight." And that was it. And they just went and killed each other. Fought, man. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. And he's like, "I think I like war." And I'm like, "No." Yeah, oh, that oh. was a beautiful line. I was like, <laughs> "Thank <laughs> you." I like him. He's 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 an interesting character. Billy West is also in this too. Like if you guys are familiar with Futurama, you would kind of sort of recognize his voice. He's actually he actually voiced um, a number of characters: the personal alchemist and wizard, Sorcerio or something like that. Oh yeah, Sorcerio. Sorcerio, the yeah. Old fraud. Yeah. Uh huh. And like, just a side note. I again, I really like um, when Bean through that big party in the castle and at the exact same time how that giant orgy was done yes. down in the dungeon <laughs> and it's weird because and how again and how they stumble upon it elfo was over here in a secret conversation so you think it's a they're plotting to to overthrow and take over the kingdom no nah, they're just plotting to go all have sex yep that's all they're doing you know we just nah, we're just getting together yeah you no know, quick orgy I mean, that's what you would think. That's what you would think, too, at the beginning of the episode when they were talking in that way. And it's like, oh, what? You would think that there's going to be some sort of serious, you know, underlining plot going on here. Like, oh, here's the interesting stuff. Like, nah, it's an orgy. I'm like, well, just as good. Just as dark shit. (laughs) And I even, like, they're so cool about, like, nah, just, you know, just just release some stress. Like, you ain't seen them. Cool, and they walk away. (laughs) That's pretty much it. I mean, it's just, you know, there were forbidden for 
and doing that in the castle. They could do it anywhere mm-hmm. else, but they just wanted to do it, it in the castle. Right. So. But it was a... It's, it's a fun show. I like it. I like the plot. I love the story writing. I like the twists on fairy tales that they put, like, really, really dark. Like Hansel yeah. and Gretel, I'm not going to go into it, but it's... Ooh, it is... You, it's dark. It is dark and great. So And great. Yeah. And, and again, it harks back to the original Grim Fairy Tales, mm-hmm. but without the life lessons. Oh, yeah. It's just straight up dark. Yeah, there's is some stuff in here. You could learn something, but nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's just straight up dark, y'all. Mm-hmm. Straight up. So learning, I I don't know what y'all gonna what you guys are gonna learn from this, but good luck, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like the first, what are we? The first thirteen episodes are right now on Netflix, and um, this is only the first half of their full season. Mm-hmm. So the second half of the season, um, I believe the I don't know why I don't have this to memory or written down, but should be at the beginning of December. The second half of the season is going to finish off the story that they're they're, they're currently on. Mm-hmm. Okay, like I said, it's all on Netflix. It's really good. It's a really good show. It is. It really is. Okay. Now, what's what's last on our list? What's what's next, my friend? Our main topic. Yeah. Our story of the day, or the week, or the podcast. Hmm. Voltron, season seven. But as I like to call it, what's the matter with Voltron? <laughs> I've been a huge fan of Voltron since I was a kid. Used to watch the original series, loved it, had a couple of... Um... I love the new iteration. I love the diversity of the cast. The voice actors are cool. But there are problems with this show, especially since we're coming down to the end of it, which I honestly think could have been avoided and could have put this down as like one of the a, a groundbreaking classic series of modern animation. First off, let me say, I really enjoy it. It's fun. It's not too serious. There are lights, there are lessons in there because the animation show for kids or period. You just want to have a story and a lesson to be learned. And there are def- in the beginning of the series, they had that. The way Netflix broke it down, instead of doing like a like a a, a lot of shows all at once and then having to wait a year, they're like, you know what, people are really liking this. We'll split everything into two. Like we'll do eight here, then another eight here, or seven, eight, whatever. And it was just a delightful experience until we found. Say season four. Hmm. In season four, you start to see a lot of cracks. You start to see character development go down a little. You start to see interaction between the voice cast and the fans get a little bit toxic. You start to see a fandom taking stuff out on people in real life for stuff that they do privately about a fictional show. And then you get worried about what DreamWorks, the company that produces the show, with Netflix, making some just odd changes. And it all brings me to season seven of Ultron, which just aired about two weeks ago on Netflix in in full, a full uh, 13 episodes. And there's a lot of hype from the, not the hype, but a lot of discourse in the fandom. Some people like it, some people love it. People are mad about characterization and representation because again it started out as people talking about they wanted to make a change about what people see when it comes to the show a diverse cast of characters with diverse backgrounds and motivations and now that we're on season seven close to the end a lot of that stuff has faded away a lot of stuff is gone and in watching season seven which i did kind of enjoy i really enjoyed it but if I take a lot of the complaints out from the fandom and get the noise out of my head from I understand why people are upset. And the problem with Voitron is not the voice cat. They're in- the problem with Voitron is not the animation. The animation is crisp and still beautiful. The problem with, Vo- with Voitron is not the fact that, you know, yes, you change up stuff so you can make more merchandise because, again, you got to make money. You got to sell toys. The problem with Voltron might be the fandom. And the way the cast and the producers interact with that fandom. 
everybody wants to be representative. That's one of the main reasons we have this podcast is to spread the love of Afrofuturism. People like us of Black and African descent from the Spire can see ourselves in fantasy, see ourselves in giant robot anime mecha, see ourselves in comic books. But when you take that representation and use it, and I don't know if this is their, what they're doing on purpose, but take that representation and use it just to fuel a fandom so people can keep interactive with the show or keep up interest story of the show, that's toxic. And from my point of view, I think that's what the cast and the producers are. They speak about LGBTQ representation and putting in characters with death. Only for those characters not to ever appear in the show, or if they do, they die in one episode. They sit there and talk about the background and diversity of the cast and their individual motivations. But then, before you realize it, the show's only about one white character. And maybe somebody else in the crew of the show gets an episode dedicated to them and then it's always back to the one white character. And if you just watch the show, that's not that big of a problem, honestly. Because you will understand in narrative writing there usually is that that one big protagonist. But when Voltron started, and again with the interaction with the cast and the producers and the writers, but they say that's how Voltron is today. And watching the show, especially season seven, that's not true. And I understand why the fandom has become going and toxic and death threats, which are unacceptable no matter how you feel. But I understand their anger. I do and too. And I'm go ahead. I, I was I, my soliloquy was quite long. I <laughs> no, it's fine. No, you're good. Because honestly, I have a lot to say about it too. But I've also thought about it a lot, and it's kind of I've lost. I've kind of lost steam. Like I've always I've always felt some kind of way about the show. Not since the from the very beginning. I didn't actually start watching the show until just before season two dropped. But um. I've always felt some kind of way from seeing fans interacting, from seeing the producers and the voice actors interacting with the fandom, and it's it's a whole different world that we're seeing here because, again, when you look at the show by itself, it does have a lot of problems. It's a good show. It's fun to follow. The animation is gorgeous. Like, I, oh my god, they really, really have done a tremendous job with the animation in all the seasons, especially seven season. I've heard, I haven't seen it for my own personal reasons. I will get to it just not right now. Cause again, I'm maintaining my distance in terms of that because of the discourse, but you, you know, the animation's absolutely beautiful. The voice cast phenomenal, putting in so much work and emotion into their characters no matter how much screen time and how li- or how little screen time each of them have gotten, they've all done an excellent job bringing these characters to life. So you got to give them credit for that. You got to give them credit for what we for the good we have seen. Now, as Darren mentioned from the beginning, you look at a show and it was promoted not just by DreamWorks but by the executive producers too. That it's a, it's an ensemble show. Okay. Like, again, like Darren mentioned, that you will always have your shows where you have like the one protagonist and it's about them. We already know from the beginning it's about that protagonist. But in this case, we're told different. We're told that it's an ensemble show. It's about each of these different characters being thrown into something they didn't even know existed. You know, until they're literally shown in the most, I don't want to say violent way, but rather mind-blowing way. But then it kind of slowly becomes... A story about one character because if you really pay attention how they underline a lot of themes it primarily revolves around one specific character and I'm a, and I'm gonna say his name Keith we already know that in the original Keith is somewhat of the protagonist I'm not 100% sure in the accordance to my memory I'm pretty sure Darren can expand further on that but in this he's he's portrayed as the protagonist 
especially from end of season two, season three onward, but it's not as bad until season four. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, it's always insinuated he has Galra heritage. He doesn't know who his mom is. He lost his father at a young age. He's very close to Shiro. Like, we already know these things, or we at least have an idea of he, him having quite a heavy background from the beginning. But the, the focus has been shifted towards him season three, season four onward. And it again, it's understandable why so many fans are upset about that. Myself included, because as much as I love this character and how, how much depth he has, it's like, okay, but what about the other characters? We have Pidge's storyline, where her motivation was to find her brother and her dad. And she did. She did. Her brother, um, turns out, is a rebel fighting against the Galra, and her dad was a prisoner that they freed and sent back to Earth so he can help Earth defend itself from inevitable Galra invasion. That's great. You know, we, we see her growth, we see her anger, we see her joy, all of that. That's wonderful. We see the changes and the growth of Lance over the seasons, you know, you have people being quite vocal about, you know, how there was lack of focus. But the thing is, his growth was kind of in the background. You know, it's it's subtle, but it's noticeable at the same time. Like, he has grown. He's not as flirtatious. flirtatious. Like, I'm, like, by season six, he, he, barely, he doesn't even do that anymore, which is great. But then it takes seven seasons to really get a good look at Hunk. Seven. Seven seasons. Now, I understand that, again, for those who are hardcore fans of this show, if you follow what goes on behind the scenes, they sometimes split up these these sessions, like the voice acting sessions, in accordance to everybody's schedule. The person who voices Keith is Steven Yun, and he, next to um, the voice actor for Hunk... Tyler Labine, uh, he has like the busiest schedule. Like he, this dude's everywhere. So it's understandable that sometimes, you, you know, you got to make adjustments. But at the same time, though, it takes away from seeing the full proper development and growth of each of these characters. So, you know, it takes up to seven seasons for Hunk to get at least some of the spotlight, you know, to see his background, to see his family. We get to see Lance's family, too, which is great. Um... We also get to see Shiro, but for him, for representation for the LGBTQ community, it wasn't satisfactory because for me, it feels like that a J.K. Rowling was pulled. And what I mean by that is for those who have been following, you know, Harry Potter from the beginning up until the end and all the interviews that she's done. You know, she mentions later that nobody kind of really put two and two together, but she mentions that one character, Dumbledore, was gay. And it just, everybody lost their minds because nobody was able to figure that out. It wasn't obvious enough. And that's what I mean by here. You know, the creators say that they did their best to bring that representation, but of, but of course they were just not even just obstacles to try to bring that representation to Shiro. Now, again, different interviews says one thing, other interviews say another. The consistency in that, and if they wanted to do it from the beginning, or if it's that DreamWorks said no from the get-go. It's a lot of different things, but my issue is that, was that, um, Claiming that a character has this in their in their character as them, um, for me it's like, and for a lot of others, some others are fine with just being told and going, okay, but well, seeing it, we don't necessarily have to see it to understand it. And it's like, yes, we kind of do. Because if you think about it, we're not in a place where we can have a where we can have a queer character and just know that that's how they are, that's their that's their orientation, and go with it. No, no, no. We have to see it for ourselves. We have to, like, not necessarily see them in a romantic light, but we're told that he that he had an ex fiance. We only see him once, and then he dies. Briefly. 
So it's like if then if nothing was mentioned, nobody would have known. No one would have known. And just to point of fact, the one interaction we see, they're so distant, you wouldn't think they were together anyway. Oh, in the flashback? Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't think if it's like they're just like roommates. Exactly. And which which like was together. Which was what DreamWorks was trying to push. Which was what I understand. I think that's why the executive producers and the voice actors were trying, not necessarily, not 100% the voice actors, but that I think that was the thing that they were trying to push, trying to get everybody to understand, like, look, if we don't say anything about this now, you would honestly all believe that they were just best friends or roommates. Yeah, and that's not representation. No. And I get it. I really do. Like, I feel like some people are calling it queer baiting. Personally, I don't think so. You know, people are ang- upset and calling it the barrier gaze trope, which is like the what was it the the fridge trope too that we that uh, the, women in the refrigerators the women in the refrigerators yes and it 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 certainly feels like that it really does but it's like I I understand the effort because when they mentioned that in San Diego Comic Con everyone was excited I was too but I knew that there was something off with it because I know for a fact that with animation especially one as popular as Voltron Legendary Defender being shown, not just in the United States, but in Canada and South America and other yeah, areas of the world. Going to suck her up. Yeah. Exactly. You have the show being shown globally. There's no way that the countries that this is being shown in is going to ever allow any sort of LGBTQ representation at all whatsoever. Like these countries, these are some countries where um, being gay is illegal and yeah. punishable by death. So, like, like we understand that, you know, representation is so important, especially in the writer's room. Yes. However, sometimes we need that representation where the money is. We need that representation where the CEOs are and we need that representation in legislation, yes. legislation. Like it's not just, you know, the, the writers of the show, the people who, you know, run the show, they only have so much power. They can only do so much in trying to bring that representation in. But it's such a systematic thing. Number one. Number two, television, media, entertainment is still heteronorm- heteronormative. It's still heteronormative despite all the changes that we're seeing right now. The changes it's j- right now that we're seeing is just the beginning. The fact that human beings are very, very slow to change. Very slow. It'll take a millennia for human beings to take a 180 from how we are right now. I'm just telling you all this right now. I have faith that it's going to take that long. That's <laughs> like, listen, <laughs> like, I don't know. It could take that long. It could be less than that. We don't know, but definitely not in this generation. Although what we're doing now is, is definitely a kickstart. It's definitely a kick to the butt and saying, Hey, listen, we are different and we need to be represented. And that's great. But this change is slow. That's why so many, again, so many people are upset with the so-called representation, but you know, you know, you have somebody who says that, okay, we don't have to see it. I beg to differ because like I said, it's heteronormative. When you see a character on the screen, Darren, what do you assume about this character? And don't like, like just literally like, tell me, like you see a, a, a guy on the screen, yeah, he's I a main protagonist. A like, right. You see a guy, like, what do you think? Like, do you think that he's going to be like the hero of the story and get the girl at the end? Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. And that's the heteronormative gaze because that's what we're seeing constantly throughout history. Uh, the, the LGBTQ has always been around since the dawn of time. It's just for some reason, it's always been pushed aside or being shown as kind of deviant or bad or not appropriate for children. And so now we have the opportunity to break that mold and we're breaking it. But... It's again, we're still trying to break out from the heteronormative because like we just talked about, you have one character, you automatically assume that they're going to be the big hero who wins the girl at the end, not the guy or the non-binary person. No, the girl. So, and the thing is we know about that because we actually see them in that romantic light or at least expressing that interest. Interest. Yes, exactly. So When we don't see that, but we're told, oh, but that person's queer. It's like, no, I can't accept that because I don't see them like that. And then they wind up uh, with a hor like again, with a horrible ending or a terrible life, or at least, you know, yes, Shiro is a fantastic character. He's incredibly resilient. I'm like, listen, I don't know what breed of human he is, but he managed 
to, you know, survive torture, having his arm cut off, being cloned, dying, oh, and dying, and dying, <laughs> dying, <laughs> dying <laughs> having a, de- tw- okay, having a degenerative disease, actually yes, dying, disease. Yes. <laughs> actually dying, and then coming back. You are literally, you put this amazing, strong, very incredibly kind and empathetic character, mm-hmm. you know, through the just through the mm-hmm. ringer, mm-hmm. through the ringer. And again, for some people, it's fantastic. Yes, and he's also queer. Great representation. But again, there's still a lot mm-hmm. of problems with that because we also see we that. we see the disease. We yes. see the death. We see the cloning. Exactly. We, we don't see him being queer. We no. don't see him being in love with a man. No, we don't. That. Plus, it, <sighs> throughout, okay, again, through media, the representation of queer individuals lesbian or gay or bi or what have you it's they always have a tragic backstory or a tragic end rarely Mm -hmm. rarely do you see an actual happy ending i remember there was one book i read in high school called boy meets boy and it was the cutest book i've ever read in my entire life but there was an actual happy ending you know there were some issues you know and they addressed it because it was it was a it was a decently written story and i liked it but that was the only queer fiction i've ever read with a good ending and not too angsty story because you know it was about teenagers would you duh um but otherwise i again i read another story where it was literally it took place in the south in the south so that off the bat like in the south like 1950s 1960s so off the bat y'all already knew that things are not going to wind up well and they didn't. Like, one of the characters dies at the end. And I was so upset. I was so angry. So, understand that, on the one hand, you have people who are happy to see Shiro, who's been through the ringer, be the queer representation, even though you actually don't see that part of him. And again, like, I just I just always have the issue with people saying you don't have to see it. It's like, no, nowadays, you kind of have to. Until we're at the point where you don't need to see it. Where it's so normal that you don't that you just assume. Not everybody just assumes the queer narrative. Everybody assumes that the character is straight until we are we have seen otherwise. That's just how we are as human beings. We need to see it to believe it. Mm-hmm. So I can't I cannot get on board with, oh, I'm fine with being told, not shown. I'm not fine with that. Right. I need to see that part of the narrative. If romance is not a part of it, okay, that's fine. Then we don't need to know the sexualities of anybody in the story. Until exactly. we see it for ourselves, until it actually contributes to the plot. Like, have, then, having that announcement, just for me, it just doesn't tell me anything. Right. And I think, like I said, that's the major problem. And I think that it's a scary road for fandom to go down. Mm-hmm. Is, and not just, not queer baiting, but diversity baiting. Yeah. You're sitting here saying, oh, we got this, and this background, and this character. And this. They're all going to have their roles, and we'll have this person representing this co- in sci-fi or in this genre and you completely repeatedly say it over and over again in interviews and Twitter comments at cons but then when the actual show itself comes out it's not there no no it's not and I, like I said now, that's the, the main problem with Voltron and it's that interaction which I hope doesn't spread to other fandoms like if you're gonna put something in the show, put it in the show. Or if there's something you want to put in the show, but you wait till the show's over to talk about it. Exactly, exactly. But don't in the middle of the production and coming out and you've got people hype like, oh my god, I'm gonna see myself on the screen in this light never seen before. And then they watch this like nothing happens, and then you're surprised at the anger. Like you can't be surprised at the anger when you do that. No. And you could be like, well, I didn't know and all, but you're in the middle of making it. So if you don't know. Don't say anything. Right. They need better PR management, yeah. honestly. Yeah, fandom, <laughs> fandoms are becoming more toxic, or at least the toxic people are becoming more vocal. There's no need for you as the creators and the voice cast and the writers to add fuel to the fire. There's no need for it. Because unfortunately, no matter what you do, the toxicity is probably going to be there anyway. Exactly. So don't add to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, the, and it does get to the point where death threats have occurred and it's again not 
not excusable. Like, don't ever do that. Don't ever send a death threat to anybody about something you're unsatisfied with. It's just like, again, at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's just a show, you know, let it be, you're upset with it, let it go. Or if you're upset with it, vocalize it in, in a manner where you can just discuss it, but don't tell somebody to die because you're on, you're upset that your two favorite characters didn't interact. Don't, don't do that. That, that's, Mm -hmm. no, that's, that just puts a bad look on everybody involved in the fandom or in people who are just trying to have fun. Who are just, you know, contributing their own to the fandom with their own artwork and what, what have you. You know, it's just a show. You know, these people are just doing their jobs, trying to bring something to life that they're passionate about. You may not agree to it. You may criticize it. That's fine. Everybody's not going to like the same thing for the same reasons. Just don't, don't be a dick about it. Don't be mean about it. Don't dox others. Don't scream at others for liking something you don't or extremely against just just let people be as long as nobody is hurt it's fine but if you're the one stepping up trying to hurt others that's a no like don't don't do that not in this fandom not in the next one not in the previous one just no that ugh. and on that note mm. we're gonna shut down so just no <laughs> stop being toxic enjoy what you enjoy and let other people enjoy it the way they want to mm-hmm. no matter what's been said if they want to watch it, let them watch it. If they don't want to watch it, it's cool too. Right. So Just jump on something else. Thanks for, yeah. So thanks for listening. <laughs> Please like, comment, subscribe, share this with all your friends. Next time. Join the initiative. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye.